human beings have the ability to create, but the deeper you dive into it, it's more of a co-creation, right? So there's some things that we can control, some thoughts, some ideas. My hands have limits to what they can do. I can co-create in the environment that I'm in, and you put me in different environments, my abilities change based on where I am. So I like that idea of a dance. This implies yeah. that there's a there's a give and a take. But it's a bit of, I mean, for sure, there's a school of thought, at least in the training of an architect. I would say the practice, too, where, you know, you hear words like rigor and, and uh, you know, there's a kind of heroism to regardless of what I encounter or what feedback I get, I'm just going to keep going this way. And, and that's honorable. And, you know, and that 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 other more nuanced um, choreographed it thing is 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 uh, is a different deal <laughs> yeah it's totally different. i couldn't do this without you felipe <laughs> yeah likewise welcome to the ebfc show the easier better for construction podcast i'm your host felipe engineer manriquez this show is all about the business of construction today's episode is sponsored by the lean construction institute LCI is working to lead the building industry in transforming its practices and culture. Its vision is to create a healthy and thriving industry that delivers outstanding project outcomes every time for everyone. Check the show notes for more information. Thank you, LCI. Now, to the show. Welcome, Stan. How's it going? Hey, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. How are you? Good, man. It's good to see you. Ah, it's good to see you. Thank you for joining me on the the Easier Better for Construction podcast. You know, guests like you are the perfect guests because you're definitely working to make our industry easier and better for all. And the work that you do touches okay. many, many thousands of people. I know in your career you've probably you're probably close to a million person impact. Oh. I'm sure. If you think about the the scope and breadth of jobs you've been on, I bet you you're over a million people impacted. Wow, I I had not thought of that. Yeah, huh? Yeah, you may be right. I, yeah. yeah, yeah. So Big with job. that, I've been doing it for a while. <laughs> yeah, with that, Stan, why don't you introduce yourself to our audience and let them know who is Stan Chu? Uh, Felipe, thank thank you so much for for inviting me to this, and um, and I don't know that I have all the answers to that, but but uh, but, <laughs> but I, there are some things I know. Yeah. Give us yeah, <laughs> give us the things you know for the sure. Stuff I know for yeah. sure. Yeah. <laughs> I'm an architect, uh, an architect, uh, a husband, a father, and um, and a, a lot of my work as an architect has been in the healthcare area in our industry. Uh, for quite a while now, probably going on um, close to 30 years. And I've gotten to work with some amazing clients who have, have um, are driven to do things better, you know, who, uh, who think about both op operations and experience kind of as the, at the, the core of what they do. And some of those clients have had, um, have introduced me to lean or, or kind of had an expectation that I would, would adopt, uh, would be open to slash adopt that mindset of really, really understanding what those, what the, the values that drive a project are that, it, that the building is not a product, but it's a, um, it's not a shell either. It's, it's almost like a machine. It's, it, it's a, it's a vehicle for doing something else like delivering healthcare. It isn't yeah. uh, it isn't the end product. It's just the beginning of, of, uh, of a whole lot of stuff. Um, I like your million people. I mean, it's, this sort of ties directly into that, that that's really about what these projects are. It's, it's not a, it's not the building itself. So, so from that, I've gotten a heavy exposure into, uh, into lean and design thinking and, and through, you know, people that use scrum and, um, and then better ways of doing things through prefab and modularity and design approaches and, and all that sort of stuff. But, but, but in all that, I think that the biggest of big umbrellas is a, a, a way to do things better. So rather than a legacy based approach of this is our system and here's how we do it. And we're going to teach you to do things this way. And we don't want you to ever change. <laughs> There's this improving <laughs> mindset, improving, learning, growing, you know, adapting back to what we were saying before mindset. And uh, so you can always do better. And then at the heart of it, I think when we're at our best, it's, it's also organized around a deep kind of respect, care, compassion, support for the people who are, are, are using these spaces to either do work or, or, um, or have work done for them. Yeah, so absolutely. I feel really lucky in that regard. <laughs> you are really I'm, lucky. I'll, I, I I'll second it. that. 
<laughs> no, I feel it. I have, yeah, there's so many people have been, have taught me so much. I mean, it's really, it's amazing. It's, uh, I, I, I feel really, really blessed. Um, LCI has been a big, a big piece of this. I, I sit on the board of the Lean Construction Institute and, um, you know, and that organization has really evolved over the years. Um, and I, I uh, you know, there have been so many great chapters of, of this journey and um, I'm, uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and I and some I was of the just, things I know, <laughs> some of the things I experienced. Well, I, I know something from about you that I pay attention, and luckily <laughs> you and I have gotten to share a stage or two and present on different topics. Uh, the last one I think you and I were together on was the Design Build Institute Western yeah. Region, yeah, right, which was great in Napa. Oh my God, yeah. <laughs> you remember the wine glass? <laughs> the wine glasses were like this big; <laughs> they were like know. the size of my face. Yeah. You could pour an entire wine bottle in. Yeah. To a single cup. It was awesome. But I remember you saying something about early in your career, Stan, you worked as a carpenter. Ah, uh, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Can you tell yeah. people what that's about? Because that's very unique, I think, for someone who's a practicing, thriving architect today. Oh, Lupe, thank you for remembering that and for asking. Um, yeah, I got out of, out of architecture school. Um, uh, we were, there was a pretty good support system for grants, for helping students understand what grants were available, you know, and, uh, and even a teeny little bit of coaching too. And uh, I applied for and got a grant to work in Japan, um, you know, a country that's got a lot of lean associations with it. Um, yeah. So I, 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 uh, I spent a year there and I worked nine months as an architect in kind of a black cape um, office doing museums and concert halls and that kind of work and then I spent three months working as a traditional carpenter on a on an island off Kobe and um, and the thesis of the grant um, was to think about the role of the architect and um, the ability to predetermine an outcome you know, if you think very simplistically that that uh, you know one, one view of the world could be that we architects uh, have predetermined every single outcome about a building and somehow in the immaculate determination there's also an immaculate kind of uh, delineation so every one of those outcomes is perfectly captured and yeah. and uh, and illustrated <laughs> and then maybe even directed you know if you're really yeah. out there and that conception that maybe was even born in like a cave somehow just comes to fruition mm -hmm. uh, through the 10,000 other people that somehow understand that that vision and uh, and I was really interested in, um, you know, there's some Japanese aesthetics where the artist are, is not, is both, yeah, you know, heavily influenced, you know, hand of the artist very strong, but also not fully um, independent. You know, mm -hmm. there's, there's something maybe in ceramics that happens in the kiln or in fabric making that happens in the weaving. It may not be the best example, but. No, it makes sense to me. Yeah, where the, the artist has, ha, there's an interplay between what the artist is doing and, um, and Minge is kind of a, 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 a uh, I, I think I, if I remember right, I wrote the grant really around that and thinking about that spirit in Japanese culture where it's not about perfection and it's not about absolute control of the artist. It's about the interplay and there's something about, I mean, it tends to be a little object focused, but there's something about the object that reveals not just the artist, but also the material and something about the culture and sort of bigger messages and complexity all in this simple thing. And, uh, and so I wrote about that and, uh, and how interesting it might be to go to Japan and experience that from uh, in the way architecture is modern, in, in the ways of, an, of a modern system, you know, sure. an office that does concert halls and in the ways of a traditional system, you know, building a house in a forest on an island. <laughs> <laughs> so that was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> that was a, a pretty great experience. Yeah. And, and for sure in both of those, in fact, I would say the seeds of my kind of lean exposure were, 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 were sown in that year, um, both in the, you know, living this fast paced life in Tokyo, working at a high powered office and on this island working with a carpenter. And it, in each of those, the, the interplay between the, 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 the designing and the doing um, mm -hmm. was really different than I had, than I believed and had experienced in working in the US. And, um, and there's a kind of adaptability. This Felipe steers right back to 
when you and I were, were, were just talking, the ability to adapt and be nimble and be flexible and, and adjust to, to uh, but not to, not to just let go and, and, you know, float around and not have any kind of steerage in this, but, but to really, you know, have a kind of dance and choreography with whatever it is that you're doing. Yeah, I like that metaphor, Stan. You just said the dance and choreography, uh, and I like to play in agile methodologies in my daily work. You know, we need each other, and it's like listening yeah. to you talk. The more you talk, the more the there's no silo between our disciplines. Like, you have to do things, we have to do things. So we take that same approach sometimes. Like, we have to build it no matter what. Yeah, right. The client that you know, is paid for us to, with our expertise and our teams of people to come in and and make it happen, and you know, create from from thinking and talk and idea to reality. And you guys think the same exact thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think when we're at our best, that, that really is. And I, one thing I love about lean is the, um, is just the focus on value. What is the best we can do? You know, and I think the good bits of that, that rigor word are really about that. You know, how can we, how can we understand more essentially what's driving this project and then what skills and, you know, resources and ultimate materials do we have to bring to, to create, yeah. to support what those needs are. It's great to have constraints to increase oh, more yeah. creativity. Yeah. Right. In including a schedule, including yeah. a schedule, including yeah. a budget. Let me throw that. And including down. a budget. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. You don't have all the money budget. in the world. Yeah. But yeah, no, that's a, that is really interesting. And, you and I, I think we first met, it was 2016. I had just come into this role and somehow we got connected. I don't even remember how. Uh, and, and I do it, remember a lot of people say, you got to meet Felipe. You got to meet Felipe. You got to meet Felipe. I feel like it was a, a small army of forces yeah. pulling me to you. <laughs> well, that, that's, that's, that's news to me. That's awesome. <laughs> but uh, I got to spend time in one of your offices and uh, people in your office were practicing Scrum. And you guys had read the Jeff Sutherland's book, The Art of Doing Twice the Work in Half the Time. And we did a little lunch and learn. And there were some familiar faces there and some new faces. And and I just thought, like, I've died and gone to heaven. Uh, I'm inside, you know, I'm inside of a firm <laughs> where all these people are coming to talk about something that is really interesting to them and that they could see it in their own work. And it was just yesterday. Uh, I was helping a team. The team had a choice. They're doing a basis of implementation. Mm. And they said, we can use a traditional Gantt chart schedule, critical path method waterfall schedule, or last planner system of production controls, pool planning, or we can use Scrum. And uh, it was the McCarthy people that said, let's try Scrum. <sighs> I thought, wow, look at how much has changed in five years. <laughs> and, I, and I was like, are you sure? Yeah. <laughs> so, so we uh so we did it uh, we yeah we, we got a team together we had five architects three general contractors on the phone and one scheduler and we scrummed a process for programming wow. so for those so you know I, I don't know to give the really good definition stand but what's a high level definition of programming with a client that so people can understand you know tell tell a general contractor who's on the phone or <laughs> listening in <laughs> What's program? What do owners do in programming? Well, it's um, boy, what did if someone was just telling me they, uh, uh, yeah, I think it was Nate who was saying, you know, really all we do is take words and these abstract thoughts and concepts and turn them into physical things like walls and doors. And, <laughs> and programming is probably is the front end of that process where the abstract concepts um, to create an integrated to create a, a teaching methodology that's based on an integrated care model. So we're going to teach doctors and nurses and pharmacists together. Yeah. That's what we want to do, you know, and, and in during programming, that vision gets turned into rooms, into spaces with, with adjacencies and circulations and, and technical needs and, and all of, and code implications and all of that sort of stuff. It's not designed, but it's sort of the, the basis, the thing that, that drives the design. Probably it's, it's one of the least certain moments in a project um, so the, the points with the biggest opportunity and, and, you know, corresponding to the biggest risk. Yeah. We asked the team, like, how important is this, what we're doing, this mm -hmm. piece of work? And the team said that, uh, the client will use this to decide whether this job goes forward or yeah. gets put on the shelf and forgotten. Yeah. 
So it was a big deal. If it touches, if it contributes towards touching the million people or if it ends at seven. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Two hours later, we had a plan. People (sighs) self-assigned. A cross-functional team was born and off they went. And we revealed that, as we suspected, the design was further along than we thought. (laughs) Ah, In ways that were good or neutral yeah. or bad or hard to tell yeah. no I, I couldn't tell because I, I couldn't see anything it was just verbal but it seemed to be the right things were being done yeah. which was good like i always tell people there's when you use these agile frameworks or lean it's not with a heavy hand mm-hmm. that you do the things with people like people intuitively know what should be done and are almost always doing it and there's always little system checks and changes that allow the work to flow better mm-hmm and we had some yeah, those big, micro adjustments are really important. Exactly. People said like we had conversations in the session uh, that we probably never would have had until we were way too far along and mm-hmm. would it'd be hard to change course because it'd be too baked. Yeah. So this was yeah. really, this was exciting. It was like, ah. yeah, I didn't record it, but I did take some, some still shots. Felipe, do you think there's a framework that you could kind of pick up and then use for a, you know, 80th percent, 80% of another programming exercise? I wonder how much. Oh, yeah, you can use, I've told teams, like, if you have work to do, so this is the, the fundamental requirement. If you have work to do, yet to be done, and the work is not trivial, so you have at least four people or more mm. are working on it, so you have some complications or com- it's complicated because you have multiple people involved of, of different specializations you're in the ideal framework for a scrum implementation like your mm. team could scrum and that i've seen teams pick it up like day one we're going to work this way i've seen people pick it up at like we're struggling we need help and we've tried other things and it didn't work and they try it and, they, and it gets them over the finish line so i've seen and th- everything in between Mm. I've seen teams use Lash Planner system and Scrum together. Mm-hmm. So like in the big room, the construction team, design team, the, the co-location, they're using Lash Planner. And then, Especially probably on the milestone side yep. and the big, yeah, yeah. And then they take the, they'll take something back to the team and say, all right, we've committed to, this seems on our, my experience that we can get this done in, you know, three weeks or whatever it is. They go back to their team and the team that actually does the work breaks that apart in the scrum framework. That makes sense. Yeah. I've seen that happen too with architects. Yeah. Yeah. And I've seen construction teams using it for traditional project management type functions like contracting, purchasing, estimation, pre-construction, constructability reviews, onboarding people. Yeah. There's a lot of places to use it. Yeah. What you were just describing, that's something, um, Oh, I, um, an opportunity that hasn't been solved yet. And a, a lot of the, the last planner work that I've done, it's, it's, um, or that I've been part of, it's, uh, it's really prevalent in the integrated team, you know, so the, the designers and the contractors, you know, trade partners, yeah. engineers, architects, everybody working together. And then once you get within your own organization, which for an architecture team, there's a bit of a, it, it kind of drops off, you know, we make commitments to the bigger team and then yep. internally, quite frequently we 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 uh we don't track the work at the same level that we track the 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 work that we're giving we don't treat ourselves as partners (laughs) yeah and And that would be it's fractal stan it's fractal yeah exactly yeah 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 yeah. i have been on jobs where we pulled that back into the office and pull planned our own work to coordinate with uh, so the stickies the tasks that might show up on the group plan would then become milestones for the internal work Mm-hmm. But more typically, we just kind of drop it at that point and just kind of, all right, we'll get it done. And then at evenings and weekends and rework and all that sort of stuff become uh, workarounds to make sure that we're delivering for our partners as opposed to tracking the work and leveling and monitoring. Yeah. Leveling. I mean, I'll tell you right now, people will appreciate leveling the work stand, <laughs> especially yeah. Yeah. the workforce today. Uh you know, yeah. right now with the there's a pandemic afoot. It is 2020, and we're still in the first year of the pandemic. And burnout is something that there's been a lot of a lot of uh, conversation about with a lot of different firms, both in design, engineering, construction, and trades. The people doing the work. It's it's and even owners. I've I've talked to some owners have told me about how 
you know, they're, they're feeling burnout with just all the things that the uncertainty and what's happening. And, and then we have some teams that are just operating like super smooth. Like there's nothing, like there's no pandemic. And Mm -hmm. we're like, what are they doing? You know, they're often doing lean. (laughs) They're doing something. They've, they've, they've put the mindset on, they're using these, these very collaborative frameworks and the stress level on those teams is just radically different. So it's put, it's put a lot of, uh, this one positive thing about the pandemic, it's really opened up a lot of people that were in the traditional ways of working and they couldn't think of an alternative way to work that, oh man, there are different ways, especially with teams that were co-located, not having to be hybrid or completely isolated, you know, that people have found ways to collaborate. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the bad news, well, there's a lot of bad news in our current situation. Yeah. But it's, it's for sure, you know, if you think of Philippe, Philippe, what we were talking about the complication versus complexity at that DBI event, DBIA event, if, if, uh, if the old model was the complicated model, a lot of things that you could predict, but things that were predictable and would work in a way that you could, you, 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 or that was rational and understandable versus complexity, you know, lean and agile are so good at adapting and supporting that complex system. And this right now really is a complex system. It is. You know, are we going to be meeting face to face in three weeks? Uh, maybe, but maybe not, you know, in three months, probably, but not for sure. You know. Right. Right. And then if somebody, you know, gets infected and they're in a place where it's a 14 day quarantine, losing that person for two weeks unexpectedly is unpredictable. Yeah. How do you plan for yeah. that? So if you had if you had a system in place already where you had cross functional people, then you can with leveling the work you can adapt, right? Yeah. Com- companies that are doing that are going to come out of this much better than those that had extremely specialized people. Yeah. Yeah, that were working very independently from mm-hmm. from one another. I mean, I I do have I continue to have an appreciation for the simplicity of that. Um, that more siloed system where there it, it appears that you have better control because there are fewer parts or it appears that the parts predictively, but, but my experience is it just isn't that way in our industry, honestly, in the world, <laughs> there is yeah. more, more complexity going on right now than there ever. Has. It's, it's time for, it's the time for a complex adapt adaptive system is, is bigger now than, than, than maybe it ever has been ever before. And I tell people like you all have uh you have a one up on this. Like a lot of people struggle with systems thinking or design thinking. Those those tend to be a little synonymous, right? Is that that's okay to say, right? I think so. Actually, yeah, yeah, yeah completely. Yeah. yeah. So then those those two synonymous things, you know, we say like you're a living, breathing, complex system yourself. Like just even talking to you, like I can see you've got either tea or water and coffee. Yep. You're, you've got inputs coming in. Your eyes are also taking in information and you're listening i mean a lot of things going on with you you're digesting like it's very it's interesting and i'm the same way like i've got my uh my afternoon coffee in play right i'm also listening feeling i've got air movement in here a lot of things going on and we're still can it be in the same Easy. mental model and talking about these concepts these ethereal concepts of like design programming and it's fascinating. And we're doing it through a medium that's totally binary. Ones and zeros, right? <laughs> yeah, that is a bizarre construct. You're right. Yeah, because in a way, it's probably not too big a step to, to think about adaptability and, and relativism kind of in the same, the same area, you know, that, that yeah. one thing is always related to something else. And the, I guess the purity of the binary is kind of the opposite of that, right? Where it's yeah. either it's either a zero or, or a one. Yeah. Yeah. If you get nerdy, because I was an electrical engineer at one time, ah. you, you see what binary looks like as a as a function, and it's not so on off like you think it is. Ah, I believe that. I don't have yeah. that firsthand knowledge of it, but God, yeah. I believe that. Yeah, so it's fascinating. But uh, you know, one cool thing that I think that brought us together is that we both share a similar idea about lean, and it's that it's a mindset of the most simplistic statement is that things can be better. Yeah. Right. And you mentioned learning a few times in the beginning. You talked about this learning, growing, caring model, and specifically to what you're doing in healthcare. Yeah. And a lot of people get really uh, hung up on what is lean. There's probably as much 
bad information about what it is <laughs> than, uh, than what it is, right? And someone asked me early on, it was just after we had met in 2016, people were rel- regularly asking me, how do I know when I'm lean? Mm. That question has gone away. Like something happened in the environment where no one, no one cares anymore. <laughs> Say, like, maybe because it's been accepted or discarded right? but hopefully yeah. they accepted <laughs> i can't tell but i could tell you that the question's gone like it, in 2016 a lot of people asking how do i know when i'm lean and then it's zero now and this uh this past couple of months a lot of people have said you know what's a good lean tool to use oh, so yeah. people are back to looking at tools again yeah what do you think about that stan yeah, it's tough. I mean, I, I think in my own journey, there was a, uh, you know, a curiosity, interest, hunger for, for lean stuff. And it was easier to identify just like buildings. It's easier to see them as objects instead of vehicles. It, it's, it's easier to identify the tools as the stuff. You know? So yeah. I went deep on that, which was great. That was, that was pretty awesome. But it, 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 uh, for me, part of that experience was realizing, okay, the tools alone are not lean. You know, the, the, there was a mindset thing going that was harder to understand or that I didn't understand as well in the beginning. And, um, and I, I really have circled back to knowing that really it's a balance of both. And the tools will continue to evolve, to evolve probably the mindset too. But, uh, but I really like, you know, Toyota's, their two core values of, mm-hmm. uh, respect for people and continuous improvement. You know, I, I kind of, when I get, when I, it depends on who I'm talking to, but that sometimes is a good way of explaining it, that the, the, the people who are doing the work know the best way to do the work. You know, you respect the, the people who are there doing the work. And then you also respect your teammates and that, that cross-functional team. And, and the, the best idea about um, the way a building is organized may come from the electrical engineer, you know, yeah. or the general contractor. So even though, the architect's been trained to do that. That is, that doesn't mean you're the only one who generates those ideas. Same thing about a distribution strategy. Right. And then the other one, uh, that that learning, that continuous improvement, Kaizen. That's such a what a powerful thing in life. You know, as opposed to, I went to the school, I learned this thing, now I'm set. I'm just going to rinse and repeat. Yeah. I'm done. <laughs> I got it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Versus, a friend of mine oh. <laughs> was like a big. TPS, Toyota Production System fan, and we used to talk <clears> about how important it was, and and I said, it's the big thing right now, but I'm keeping my eyes open in case something else comes, and something can emerge from that, right? And, and, and things emerge all the time because, it's, uh, because of complexity. Like, even you have inspiration. Where does your inspiration come from? You can't even answer it, can you? Well, yeah. Or can you? We... We, you know, Digby Christian, et cetera, is, is, uh, has introduced, you know, this idea and others, this idea of the design being ideation and production. You know, it's like, ah, of course, you know, we're designers. We, we do have these different roles depending on whether we're creating stuff or making packages for, you know, for our partners or for HJs or for, for clients or construction, you know. So even in the front end, even during programming, programming, there's a yeah. lot of ideation going on. There's also some production. And the TPS is a great example of a production, right? The P system that's really yeah. optimized for, for reliability and um, in in production. Uh, the um, the ideation goals are uh, reliability is one of them, but but I would say creativity and maximizing value, you know, is is uh, well maybe you could say maximizing value is a one that stretches that spans both. On the production side, it's through the elimination of waste. On the ideation side, you maximize value through 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 creating more innovation. You know, it's through yeah. through adding more stuff. Set based design is a pretty pretty well known Toyota ideation tool. And if you looked at it from a production standpoint, all those extra alternates because they don't make it to the final product are waste. So f- through the TPS lens, SBD, <laughs> this is great yeah. acronyms. TPS set based design. Production, yeah, yeah. set based design really is is riddled with waste. But from a from, you know, if, if your goal is, is innovation, set-based design is a phenomenal tool, a phenomenal yeah, process. Yeah. yeah. And they use both. They use like, both. They use yeah, both. Yeah, they use both. They use both. Yeah, because yeah, it's, it's, it's one size does not fit all. You know, your, your TPS is optimized for production. It's not optimized for ide- ideation. Right. Surprise. <laughs> yeah, they use both. Like, yeah. why not use both? People always ask, like, are you, 
are you just at war with waste? And I was like, no. Mm, yeah. No. And earlier in my career, I used to think like, yeah, if I just eliminate waste, I'll be lean. And and then later in my career, it's like, no, if I really understand the mindset, I'll be able to just pull the tools and processes at, as needed. And sometimes it's not a waste thing. Sometimes it's the other parts. Oh, right? yeah. Yeah, I remember... Um... It wasn't Roseville, but another early setter job. Um, you know, we were we were getting uh, we were spending a lot of time looking at TPS, and the mentality on that project for a period of time, for sure, was you want to get rid of options. You know, you want to pick your option as early as you can because the longer you keep those options, the more wasteful, the more waste you're generating, and that that led us to Kennedy to the Blue Book, which kind of pulled you know. Pull, help pull the awareness of set-based design and and last responsible moment and delaying yeah. that because you want more innovation, not eliminating it or reducing it because you want less waste. So. Right. Yeah, and I've heard teams, uh, you know, that are dabbling in set-based design will get told by the client, and it seems like the clients just all go to the same client school to become a lawyer. <laughs> just make, you know, they, they always come with the wild card of. Hey, today, team, you're twenty percent over budget, so figure it out, right? Don't they all come with that? <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, we should ask Digby, Digby. Like, hey, at what point do you pull that card that we're over budget? <laughs> oh, but we're it, <laughs> we're giving a, a presentation next week for a Hanson Wade conference, and it's it shows the trajectory of pricing and uncertainty, and it it always goes up to a problem and then turns and yeah. a so-called problem. <laughs> <laughs> the so-called problem. The, the, yeah. the, the clients intru can introduce a problem. That's totally cool. Yeah. They, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, Felipe. I stepped no. on you. <laughs> no, it's just totally funny. I'm just laughing, thinking about all the – I'm in my mind, I'm remembering all the times I heard the owner say, we're over budget. It's so many times, Stan. That's why I'm laughing. And, I, and you know, now when it happens, you see that the newer people on the team with not as much experience, they see it as, like, a really negative thing and, like – people that are lean minded or have been around a little bit, they get excited and they're like, Oh, it's time to, it's time to, you know, maybe we could get an A3 out of this. <laughs> you know, we could, oh, yeah. it's an opportunity to do something. Well, a little bit of our thesis for next week is as understanding goes up, you know, the impacts of everything you're, you're capturing more. So pricing tends to go up, you know, your, your cost understanding goes up, the price tends to go up and, 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 you know, lagging behind that a little bit are the opportunities to bring it back down. And, yeah. And then, you know, one bends, then the other bends, and you you start coming back down into alignment. You converge. <clears throat> yeah. They always tell the client, like, don't worry. At the end of the project, when you start operating the building, that's when we'll know all the final costs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Eventually we'll know. <clears throat> yeah. 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 But it's good. I mean, so that's uh, – it's interesting. I mean, you've been on this lean journey, and you, you call it a journey. I think yeah. that's the right terminology, right? There's no – Ah, you've arrived. Like, nah, it can never happen, right? Not. <laughs> right, it cannot happen. And there are people, do you get uh, like younger or new people to your firm asking for guidance on where to start with lean? What do you tell those people? Boy, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question, Felipe. Thank you for asking. You know, I have a, I, um, I feel like I've kind of, it's either, I think it's either an evolution or a rut, <laughs> but, but a pattern. How about that? A pattern. Yeah, I'll accept a pattern. A pattern, a pattern, <laughs> a pattern of just a, a lightweight kind of just reminder of where we are as an industry, you know, how mm -hmm. we're, how we perform. And, um, you know, and if you look at, um, you know, di different measures of productivity or stress levels or reliability or, you know, all those sorts of things, um, it, it's pretty quickly and it, it's, it's brutal, but the the exhibits keep to uh, keep uh, reinforcing the same message, which is design and construction. <laughs> We're yeah. big, but we could do better, you know? Right. It's, uh, yeah. So, so uh, I, I tend to like a little bit of, of that. So, and, and, and um, so it's a level set and part of that level set, you know, we're big, we can do better and there are other ways of doing things. So one thing that might be interesting is just to consider how other industries organize themselves, how they approach things. So not necessarily we're bad, we need to change, but more like, hey, they're, they're having more success doing similar type stuff as, uh, right. as we are. Um, let's have a look, you know, so that that's, there's kind of a level set thing. And then there's a, there's a, if it's designers, if, you know, I was thinking about um, 
some conversations I've had recently about, you know, tell me about lean and how do I get started. It's, it's, a, I will commonly break um, ideation from production. For, okay. the, for architects, especially, that's a very powerful um, idea because a lot of the lean understanding that we have is based on production TPS. And some of those uh, issues don't play well with, uh, with architects, you know, nope. I, I definitely don't. <laughs> period yeah, i've heard i've heard phrases like uh don't cheapen my design don't try to make yes. me go fast yeah right, faster is not better yeah. when it's coming to ideas yeah yeah and if 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 you accept that that ideation is different than production and the lean ideation tools are different and then it's it's kind of an easy bridge to on the lean ide ideation side it's all about how do you how do you have more creativity more innovation right. more opportunity for research for exploration you know, and um, and that uh, when I'm talking to designers, that's a uh, that it, that tends to be pretty resonant. You yeah, know? we were talking about this with uh, with folks, and and I was saying that you know, when when clients ask for target value delivery, it's a whole host of things that are going to happen. Like you know, you're going to be doing set based design. You know, you're going to do cost modeling. You might, for extra credit, do continuous estimating. There's a lot of cool things that'll happen, mm -hmm. and then one of the things that I think that I see a lot of uh, enthusiasm from the design community, design engineering for target value delivery, because you have this whole idea of supporting that ideation in a yes. very high level, right? Yeah. Like, let's slow down. Let's take our time. But then what comes out of it is the team can, like, race to the finish line because so many things have been considered, decisions have been made in, in sound ways. So that's it's really exciting to see. Oh, it's, yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's almost like the design is an illustration capture of all of those ideas and decisions. Right. You know, it's, it's like everybody's talking about the same abstract thing. And then the designers bring design tools to make that into a design and the cost side, same thing, schedule side, same thing, you know, constructability, right. same thing, you know, but every it's, it's based off the same idea set, not off a design that people are putting ideas onto. Right. You know? Yeah. It's it's really cool to see how it, uh, and it does involve way more people. Like yeah. you get uh, prime trades getting involved in early, and constructability conversations happen before mouse hits computer screen. Yes. <laughs> yeah. No, no, yeah. I need another we're... metaphor for pencil to paper. <laughs> <laughs> Touchpad. Uh, Electron moves yeah. through silicon. Capacitor <laughs> mice, <laughs> a capacitor pen to to mouse pad or you know tracker. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I got to tell you, prefab just dials that up. We're doing yeah. a, a study for sort of the ultimate, um, you know, um, uh, if speed to market were concerned and you were going to develop a pretty major healthcare oriented campus, then one of the things you might consider is, um, is, is prefabbing stuff so that you could do concurrent work in, you know, site development, underground, all that. Well, the panels, modules, all that stuff are being, being made someplace else. And then you bring the, the the prefab bits onto the site ready bit you know and assemble it all together yeah. so that that job that study is really driven by uh constructability by cranes and staging and and uh and being able to transport and and, uh, and swing these big things around um that's a great example of those ideas that that um rubric kind of being worked out before um Pen hits paper, mouse hits pad, yeah. <laughs> electron hits silicon, yeah. that kind of stuff. Because yeah. that's what drives the design, not, hey, we've designed this now. How could we prefab it? Right. Yeah. Right. There's a big difference. And then for the, the clients, it seems like uh, hospitals create more hospitals. So in communities where there are health centers, they come in pairs or triplets, quintuplets. <clears throat> Like even the town that I live in, there are four major hospital systems here in town. Yeah, and they're big too. They are big. You know, yeah. You would be interesting to compare the concentration of healthcare in Roseville to like Los Angeles. Because <laughs> yeah. I'll bet you have access to higher quality care than I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It could be. I mean, I could definitely get there with less traffic than you. I mean, that's guaranteed. Everything in LA is around traffic. Yeah. Yeah. And we haven't, I mean, Roseville, I don't really know the market there, but I imagine that, um, that the competition and, you know, 
uh, those sorts of things are, are, I guess, maybe producing results in a good way, you know, cre creating more quality and capacity and all that for, for its residents in a, in a way that we just haven't seen at the same level. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely some some innovation and changes and it seems like, you know, once one of the healthcare systems builds a, a new lovely campus, the others have to upgrade their stuff and they're, they're competing and getting better. And, uh, I've even seen, I was, I was out to lunch in Sacramento. The other, this was, uh, two years ago, out to lunch with a friend and we were coincidentally staying, we're going to, a an architect's office. I mean, just pure coincidence <laughs> me and my friend, he was a pre-con director. I mean, and uh, we're, at, we're at lunch, and I'm wearing one of my lean shirts that has respect for people, continuous proven on the chest. And uh, a nurse comes up to me. They're chatting. Like, we see she's wearing her, her scrubs, having lunch. And we're right by uh, Sutter, a Sutter Hospital. And she's working. She's got a Sutter logo on her, on her scrubs. She comes over and says, hey, I just, I don't want to interrupt, but I really like your shirt. And mm -hmm. I was like, me? And, I was, <laughs> and she said, uh, She's like, I'm in charge of continuous improvement for my group. Huh. And those and she's like, those principles on your chest are exactly what we're trying to make and bring to life with our people. That respect for people and continuous improvement. And and so that we can have better patient outcomes. Yeah. And yeah. she's like, What do you do for a living? <laughs> you know, and then we started talking and my friend was just like, Wow, he's like, Your shirt does work. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, no, the, I was like, I wear it because those are the two values that are hard to live. So by having, yeah. for me, it's a little visual management yeah. for myself to remind me why and how can I do it, right? Yeah. But it's just cool to, you know, you're, man, you're in a town, and thousands, millions of people, and then someone recognizes what those are. And we start talking about how we're doing the same type of work. We're at the, we're at the early part. And she's already at the patient care part where they're already generating revenue and, and providing good health and health improvements for folks. And so I mean, that was just, it warmed my heart, Stan. I was oh, so wow. happy. It, even just hearing about it is warm in mind. Yeah, yeah. And, and arguably you two were in completely different industries. Yep. You know, sure, for sure there's overlap, but you could argue that boy, pay, caring for a patient and, and pouring a concrete deck have nothing to do with, with each other. and. Yeah, right. there you are. The roots are exactly the same approach, the same yeah. system, the same mindset. Yeah. yeah, the mindset spans across, you know, education, healthcare, many different industries, software, design, engineering. Yeah, and, for sure. and other industries are really embracing that. You know, um, it's funny. There's a lot of health education in my diet right now, and yeah. uh, <laughs> the team-based care and how you how you train. Um, people are going to be providers to, to collaborate with each other. You know, the old school model is there was a department and you went to that department, you got your education and you, you right. came out and you knew everything within your wheelhouse. And now, you know, people talk about these T T shaped skills where you've got a shallow amount of knowledge over a very broad area. And then in your own particular area, it's very deep, but you've right. got a, a bit of knowledge about what the rest of your team is doing so that you can function in a team and, and uh, and be cross-functional and educating people in that system holy crap <laughs> it's yeah. really hard it's nuts yeah it, it is hard and like when do people that's what people say in the like in the lean startup there's you know you're starting a business there's times where you work in the business and then time you should be working on the business yeah and they're not the same thing yeah yeah and the same for you know once you have a a functioning hospital and you're providing patient care how much time do you spend making that better versus just maintaining and keeping people coming through the system? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I would imagine, you know, the mindset, I believe the mindset, it's just kind of like, um, uh, uh, you know, the ability to hold to not necessarily competing thoughts, but just really yeah. different things. You've got to have a set of standards and protocols, licensing demands that. So you, you have, Legacy is a big word, but you have a kind of legacy, you know, sure. standard work that you're working from and you're also working to improve and change and respond and, right. and upgrade that standard work. So, and if you didn't have the standard work, it'd be chaos and you couldn't do anything. But if you never, if you never improved it, you'd go out of business. So, exactly. 
Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's a it's a good concept, Stan. Like that's a, and we like in the in our industry, and then we're a little jealous that some of the other industries have a longer history of standards. Yeah. Where even though we have we have tradition, you could almost see it as like it's the same thing, but it's not the same. Where do you start to do the improvement? Usually, when you're with a group of people that want to improve something, the first thing that people tend towards is like let's create a standard. Yeah. Right. And it's not yeah. always the right solution. Yeah. It's a simpler, you know, back to uh, complication versus complex. It's, it's, um, it's simpler to have that mindset to consolidate, centralize, make a library of best practices and then distribute. Maybe you've been assigned a person or a department over that that's in charge. Maybe you approach QAQC that way. So everything gets run through that one resource slash bottleneck <laughs> yeah. and we, we've asked people like we we recently our company's been around for a long time and we we did a a move like so many companies did of our size where we created like the centralized knowledge system and we thought you know if you build it they will come like people just come and consume it and then later we we looked at updating that system we did a survey and just by chance there was a question on the survey that said how do you best learn new information and it was multiple uh, choice and it said person to person use you know all the way down to use the internet yeah like and including like go off-site for professional training and the number one answer was person to person yeah it was yeah. like a landslide it was like 99 percent. yeah yeah people like to learn from other people yeah yeah and a, a system that that um facilitates uh, those connections, uh, and maybe even harvests, harvests knowledge collection slash curates, you know, as, as a part of that, I think is a great system where you're really about connecting person to person and where you can, you're trying to, without disrupting that connection, you're trying to say, Oh, that is a better way of, of detailing a, a window. You know, yeah. let me we'll grab that and hang on to it. Yeah, I, I mean, I for, for me, I uh, probably the fastest way to get information is when somebody somebody will say you got to go talk to Felipe, you know, and it's kind of like <laughs> connecting me with the knowledge center, <laughs> yeah. and then I get a download. And some of that is oh, the Sutherland book, the you know, yeah. you're yeah, kind of pointing out these resources, and then I go and get it for myself. Yeah, but it's, yeah, you start with phone a friend. It's a yeah. good a good place to start. Like I uh, I recently was doing some work with Scrum Inc, and I had to look at the Agile Manifesto from a designer's eye and a constructor's ah. eye. And I said, why would I just imagine myself as a designer? Let me just call some designers. Mm. So I called a handful of architects and man, it was, I was so glad that I did. Mm. It just made, yeah. it made the conversation. So, and then when I went back to Scrum Inc and I said, this is what I asked five people. These are the five things that they said. And it looks like there's a, an emergence of this idea here. Cause it was about what do we say instead of working software because ah, we don't we don't do software yeah right so it's some yeah. really cool stuff come out of that and i don't know, I'll, i did it myself i phoned a friend <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, that's what, and that's what scrum yeah. was doing with me they're like <clears throat> you're connected to the construction industry you're you're our phone a friend and then so then i phoned a friend so it took about you know eight people but we got something that really resonates with folks yeah, the team is, it's, uh, yeah, in Agile, they said one of their four values was that how people work together was more important than process and tools. Yeah. People and interactions is what they call it. The value of people and their interactions. Yeah. And like, you think about that, like how, how do we engage each other? That's really powerful. Like I'm sure you've facilitated a few meetings in your life, right? with like stakeholders and the way you approach them sets the tone for, am I going to get the information I need or are these people going to withhold information? Is this a safe place to share ideas or should I have already been told I can't talk? Yeah. Yeah. I remember, I think it was Rex Miller saying to me, that's the first thing when you start an engagement is to understand, is this a, is this a learning organization or I'm forgetting the second word. It was probably legacy, something like that. Mm. You know, if it's learning, then safe environment where sharing information is good and you don't always have to be right or the smartest mm -hmm. versus legacy or he, I, I bet there was another word that was much more about protection and display of knowledge and that kind of, oh, yeah. that kind of thing. Uh, 
that. I did a survey this morning, like right before your call. We had 25 people on the phone, and we asked a simple five-question survey. And we said, do you feel that in your work environment, failure is a vehicle for learning or failure is a consequence we can't allow? Brilliant. Yeah, people, brilliant. it was overwhelmingly said it's learning. And, I, and it was yeah. like, wow, that's a great change. Yeah. That, that I, I, I was super happy. And we didn't bias them. Like, I kept my mouth shut while they were doing the survey. So they didn't think, like, you know, Felipe wants you to pick this answer. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that mindset is going to just take us so far. You know, we're so vital and important right now. You know, the world really needs more, more, you know, better, better access to health care. And uh, right. the, we got homelessness going on, you know, the, the education facilities, a lot of the stuff that the world needs, people like you and I can help provide, right? The built right. environment is, right. is one of the big tools to, to make this stuff better. No, and then so some it, of the things you were talking about, even at the beginning of this call, how you were on a campus that was trying to integrate with the environment better. Oh, yeah. And not a, it's not like here's the campus stand alone and then here's the environment. It's the, they kind of blend. You're blurring those lines a lot more. And I, I'd love to see, you know, right, wrong, or different. People have strong opinions on sustainability and climate change and all those things. But just looking at how we integrate more with the environment. Like I, I like to feel more connected to where I am, you yeah. know, rather than looking at being inside of a fishbowl and looking out into something. Yeah. And I'm talking to you, you're outside. I mean, you're out there. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we're right now. One of the things we're studying is a naturally ventilated hospital, you know, which totally with operable windows and it, it, you know, in a, in, from a pandemic infection control standpoint, that totally makes sense, but it's kind of heresy. I know. Yeah. I'm not aware of any of those in the United States. Um, I'm not either. I've never seen a hospital where I can open a window unless it was a legacy building of over a hundred years old. Uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's fair. I think I've seen a couple of those. And then you see the windows are nailed shut. Yeah. <laughs> or screwed shut. <laughs> right. uh, oh, that's fresh. Yeah, if you think from a, from a interface with the planet standpoint, we're sort of transitioning from you know, uh, this manifest destiny deal where we can just do the harm we want and there are resources for us to use. And that's our role to, to kind of a more Hippocratic do no harm, you know, and in, in that, I think that's kind of where we're trying to be as an industry. There's some, our work will not negatively impact things. And the, the big step forward from that would be our work positively impacts things yeah. you know, because we're doing this project here, the watershed's better or, you know, Carbon emissions right. go down or not just we're not making it worse, but we're, we're actually making it better. Right. Yeah, that is that's please do that. <laughs> well, <laughs> there's probably somewhere those old those things we've been orbiting around respect for people, continuous improvement. You could probably take that same mindset and apply it to, you know, relationship to the planet. You know, right. that, that, yeah. yeah. Somebody hit me up the other day. They're like, you talk a lot about Scrum. I'm like, yeah, I love Scrum. And then it seems like you know something about lean. And the question was, what do you think about lean and sustainability? And I said, oh, I'm just so, I'm glad you asked. I said, I just so happened to have a friend that runs a website, James, who you know, oh, Lean IPD. And I said, yeah. he, he asked me the same question and I wrote an article for him and published it. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like, I think that like you said it exactly, the two go hand in hand. They're not separate things. Oh, yeah. If you have a respect for people and you think things can be better and you can improve all the time, we do need to, to apply that to how we build, right? We're not going to stop building. Yeah, we're not going to stop building. And I think there's a business advantage, um, you know, to, to I mean, the, the great thing about lean is, you know, if you're driven by quality, frequently an unintended outcome is it's a more efficient practice that costs less money as well. Right. You know, same thing on the sustainability side. The, to the, the groups that will figure out how to do that effectively are going to be very successful financially. So, you know, I, for sure, I believe it's the right thing to do. There's also the great financial opportunity in this too. Yeah, there is. Absolutely is. No, it's really great. Uh, Stan, I can't believe how time flies so fast. Ah, <laughs> We are, I don't want to take up so much more of your time. I need to let you go back and, and build and or design the next great thing <laughs> with oh. your teams. <laughs> so I want to make sure that, uh, that's what I was telling the team the other day too, like, Think about doing Scrum so you have more time to design. Yeah. Give yeah, you back a, some more time. That's a very powerful message for the day. Yeah. 
So you share that with your teams. And as always, Stan, you can call me anytime you like. <laughs> I think I may be tapping you for, for some advice about uh, about staging this prefab thing. I, uh, I'm realizing I, I, uh, the phone a friend thing is high in my mind. <laughs> yeah, I know some people that are really deep into that and have a lot of great experience there. So there you go. Yeah, yeah. we can definitely. If I can't answer your question, I can connect you with one more call to someone that can. Felipe, thank you. Thank you so much for your time and for yeah. for for holding these shows. This is fantastic and, yeah, and you're moving. Welcome the industry where it really is going to benefit everybody. So I really appreciate you doing that. Yeah. I want people to be excited, Stan. There are a lot of people like yourself that are working in this industry to make it better. And it's a great place to work. It's a great spot to be in. And there are people all over planet earth that are listening in right now. And they're in this industry where they're thinking about it. Come on in. <laughs> Come on in. So thank you so much, Stan. Have a great rest of your day and I'll catch up with you really soon. Okay. Thanks, Felipe. Talk Bye -bye. to you soon. Bye. Very special thanks to my guest. I'm Felipe Engineer Manriquez. The EBFC show is created by Felipe and produced by a passion to build easier and better. Thanks for listening. Stay safe, everybody. Let's go build.